Welcome to Vija Please, a Havel Voyage through the Delta Quadrant. My name is Joseph. I'm your co-host, Peter. And Peter, we have a jam-packed, just chock-full, howdy-doody of an episode this week, so let's just get into it. What did we watch? Season 4, episode 4, Nemesis. I haven't watched this one in a long time. I barely remembered the plot. Uh, I f- I'm so glad we rewatched this because I think my enjoyment level of this was many times greater than it ever was previously. I am all over the board on this episode with a lot of mixed <laughs> feelings, and I, I think I need to work them out with you. It took me almost three hours to watch this episode because at certain points I was like, I'm going to go do the laundry. This sucks. And <laughs> at other moments, I was like, this is really coming together in ways I wasn't expecting. So uh, I think we need to go on a journey together so I can figure out whether or not I thought this was good or hated the shit out of it. You know what I loved about this, Peter? What I loved about this is that this is a parallel to one of my other favorite fictional universes. And I got into that fictional universe after the original run of the show. So that maybe that's why I didn't make the connection at the time. But I love Warhammer 40K, specifically the science, super science fiction version of the Warhammer universe. OK, I love it so much that when I got married, the wonderful Jess, who's one of our fans, who is the maid of honor, uh, made for me my own cake, a groom's cake that was shaped like a uh, salamander space marine helmet. Aside from the fact that I, you know, married my wife, it was probably my second favorite thing about the wedding is that I had this cake. It was the coolest thing because I love Warhammer 40K. I I don't like the actual miniatures game, but I love the universe. I love I've run a an RP uh, tabletop RPG in that universe. You love the lore. I, lo- I love the lore. I love reading the books. Love it. OK. And essentially, if I were to subtitle this episode, it would be. Chakotay encounters discount Katachin jungle fighters because in the Warhammer 40k universe, there's these dudes called the Katachin jungle fighters who live on the worst planet in the whole galaxy. Literally, it is just made up of shit that is trying to just kill you and then all of your friends and then all of your family and then buttfuck your grandma all the time. So if you survive on that planet, you're like the hardest motherfucker there is. It's a planet full of Rambos as a consequence of the planet always trying to kill you. And they're all like these badass jungle fighters. And these guys were essentially super discount version of that. Like, you know, like baby's first Katachid recruits. And I fucking loved it. The interesting part of this entire story to me revolves around the concept that Shakote did not get enough quality screen time in episode or season three. This is pretty much exclusively a Chakotay episode, and I found the premise that he needed a Chakotay-centric, like, screen hog episode super crazy, because, like, Chakotay just came out of season three for us as, like, MVP. I don't know if I would say he was in an overwhelming number of scenes from season three, but I think he really, season three was his, like, breakout season, for me at least, personally. Um, this all really just came out of the blue and when we start it (laughs) this is what i the third episode in a row now where we are centered around a shuttlecraft being destroyed yes yes this we're not even gonna show it this time we're not even gonna bother with wreckage it's like yeah 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 one of the fucking shuttlecraft blew up whatever who gives a fuck we got infinite of these motherfuckers like we are beyond a joke at this point it was uh the cochran blew up in uh Day of Honor, and before that was the gift with Kess. So there is definitely a theme for season four, and it is stay the fuck out of the death carts, or you're going to have a bad time. And that's what's happened at Chakotay in this thing. We open to uh, a jungle scene, which this jungle they use their their outdoor location. I, I'm assuming it's a sound stage. It has to be because it everything be. and everything is is filmed so tight. It's got to be in a soundstage. I can't even tell you if I think it's a a good jungle or not. Like, that's how confused I am on this episode. Part of me wants to be like, this looks like shit. And the other part of me says, man, I've seen a lot worse outdoor locations in Voyager. And this is not one of them. My nerdy 
uh, joy aside at the parallel that I was drawing in, in my brain and maybe, you know, a, a, a half dozen of other of her listeners might understand. This episode was definitely all over the place qualitatively. I love the idea behind it, though. Conceptually, it is very, very interesting, very interesting episode of Star Trek. And they structure it in a way that, yeah, it's it's a little weird that Chakotay is like the center, but he also is the character that makes the most sense to be in the center. Yelled at the screen a couple times with some of the dialogue they put in his mouth. I'm sure we will get to that. Yes. But I don't mind the choice of Chakotay being the center of this, even though I'm not disagreeing that he wasn't the right pick for it. My commentary earlier was just that there was a feeling that Chakotay was getting robbed of screen time to a degree where he needed this, this Rambo episode. Because again, I think that Chakotay, if anything, has been coming out stronger and representing more, especially with stuff like worst case scenario in recent mind. Uh, but there he is. He's getting marched through what is a OK jungle at night. By dudes with guns. When I say dudes with guns, I mean humans. Straight up, no two ways about it. These are human beings. There is no dried salami in the hair. There is no shit on the nose. There's no pointy elf tip ears. These are 100% uh, human guys that I think the dinosaur people would have taken serious issue with. And they are marching Chakotay through the jungle to some very... Predator one ish jungle music with what are very clearly earth machine guns. And these are like Ruger assault rifles with no sci fi dressing on them at all. They're just straight up 90s assault rifles with flashlights on them. And you are now in Vietnam. I mean, that's exactly the vibe they're going for, right? This is supposed to have that Predator commando vietnam feel to it and i while yes they these guys have probably the least amount of creativity in their design of anything to do with makeup or their props i mean they could have just stolen this off the set of any paramount war movie what they did put a shit ton of awesome effort into don't even say dialogue joe i the the the, a level of effort that i couldn't help but respect and enjoy was the dialogue joe yes peter what, what's coming out of your mouth right now I, what, what's coming I out of my mouth is truth later it's i want to get into this later to, to it's play what's this coming out of my mouth part. it is it is it is stone this cold is correctness. the episode title that you are going to put on this podcast and it is going to be applying to chakotay and it's going to be applying to you right now and the title of this episode is going to be called going native <laughs> No, the title of this episode is going to be uh, to what? What? Put your peepers aside for (laughs) you. You're you're fucking with me, right? Like, no, I'm not fucking with you. I'm not fucking with you. It is every other time we have met any other alien race, their language always sounds just like normal human English. And wouldn't it make far more sense that? While the universal translator might be translating Joe, that, I'm a face palming so hard right now. Please yeah, tell you me are, you're fucking with me. Because all this truth is trying to penetrate into your brain and you're resisting it. You're trying the not to let it in because you want to live in your ignorance, part. Peter. But no, but no, I'm not going to let you, Peter. I'm going to make sure you understand that this was the best part of the episode. The best part of the episode was that they put time into how these guys talk and make them seem alien. Far more alien than anything you could have done with their actual appearance. It looks and like that- someone took the script and turned it into Mad Libs and said, all right, I need an alternative word for eyes, attention, focus, sleeping, kill. And now we're just going to do a control F, uh, find and replace all the instances, of this. And we're going to call eyes gazers and kill nullify and and whatever the other code words, I, I wanted to write them down. It wasn't just the words, though. It was their pattern of speech was much more ye old english e, which combined with the strange use in phrases 
made it seem much more sing-songy and alien. And I thought that it was very an interesting choice on their part to differentiate these guys. I see what they were going for, and I see what you're trying to turn this into, and it instead came off as a silly bit that went way too far. And I even have specifically in here, I feel very sorry for all the actors, especially the leader guy at the very end where he's trying to give this rousing speech before his unit goes on a suicide mission. And I'm like, this dude's really trying to bring some like gravity and consequence and like really rally the troops and get your blood boiling in it. And it just sounds so stupid coming out of his mouth because this clumsy, clunky ass script. Uh, we're going to have to agree, agree to disagree on this one because that is, in my opinion, hands down the worst part of this episode. So anyways, these uh, these Irish mercenary knockoffs with their silly sing song speech, they're marching Chakotay through the jungle. And they get him to a clearing. And I notice that Chicote, he's not blindfolded as though he was going to, you know, be kept in the dark about where he's being paraded off to. They just have him him gagged. And I can only assume that some point along this little trek back to their base camp, Chicote started trying to tell people about his backstory. And someone with some <laughs> forethought just cut him off and said, No one cares about your backstory, and you are now going to be gagged. Truly, he would be the nemesis in the trunks, and they would leave him to be nullified. uh, You hear how stupid you sound right now? (laughs) Because that's how stupid everybody else sounded in this entire episode. Stupidly awesome. Got him! I got him! Speechless! I did it! (laughs) I... I... (laughs) I hope they crucify you on the internet. I hope as soon as this thing hits airtime, someone burns your house down. Because I can you are see your there. face right now. I mean, it's like it's I a can't face actually of disappointment. see it. I can see it, though. I can see it right now, and it's just filled with such contempt. <laughs> and I love it. So they get him back to this base camp, and the the leader guy comes over, and he rips the lieutenant a new asshole and says, look, this guy very clearly isn't uh, the nemesis, which is the term that they're going to use to describe their mortal enemies. The the humans are basically at war with an invasive species, which we will later come to find is like the worst case scenario for ugliest of ugly bad guy uglies ever. They're like, uh, remember the Nausicans, the dudes who stab Picard in the yeah, chest? Yeah, it was like a mix of the Nausicans and that one shot of that lizard alien that we got in the and episode. Predator. Of- where where Neelix was taking care of the uh, baby with with Tom Paris on the planet, and they like yeah, throw down. Bump. And and like predators in there, and Kalis, oh. if you remember him from, uh, or Feckler, I think was his name. The 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 Klingon devil. Like these are ugly fucking dudes. And it is. when compared to like regular looking human guys who talk dumb, they look really really evil. Yeah, let's be real though. Predator is the primary. In inspiration for everything in this and the design of the bad guys quote unquote is no exception the the ten the the little mandibles in the mouth area is entirely intended uh, the yeah the dreadlock look the sort of sloped forehead i mean they 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 came real close to the like you know i don't know if there's a, a such a thing as a copyright or, or some kind <laughs> of patent on the predator look but they cleaved as close as they could get to that line and, and still so say they were doing something. jump ahead here for a moment. Did you catch when they finally give you a good look at these guys? Did you check their outfits out? I, I they seemed like they were wearing like hobo robes. No, man, they're like these ugly ass black leather outfits. And it's totally what the like fascist government from resistance when uh, Janeway had to go do one of her jail bus and like the big hooker scandal. Remember the guy? Oh, thought yeah, he- yeah, yeah. They, they like run into this uh, totalitarian government and those uh, are straight up their uniforms. I was like, these things are hideous. And I took a real good look and I was like, no. And yeah, I mean, it's, it's, this is like a super bargain episode on some levels and really innovative on others. Like they've got a bunch of these, yeah, ugly innovative, ass- like in the language, you know, it's, it's very innovative. Son, I am disappointed. (laughs) Uh, They get him in. They rip him a new asshole. 
uh, say, look, this clearly isn't these ugly ass dudes that we're at super war with. And Chakotay starts kind of learning what's going on here exactly. His shuttlecraft, as we had mentioned earlier, was flying over doing some geological surveys on the planet. As soon as he slowed down, he got zapped. He crashed to the surface. Luckily for uh, the crew, there was no disposable ensigns with him this time. The same way there was with Unity when uh, What's-Her-Face got shot up. And he starts learning that this is a real shitty jungle war that's going on here. That there are a lot of reported war crimes in progress. And that this is a beleaguered people who are fighting for their lives against an impossible foe. And through this we get introduced to our first sympathy character who is a fresh young recruit, uh, new to the unit. And he's got a bad case of the shakes because he's afraid and he has never met one of these before. And he kind of has the ire of those serving around him because they think that he's a big sissy and that he's going to be a liability and he has to try and prove himself wrong. This is Wraith and Joe. Did Wraith look familiar to you? You know, he didn't, but I am imagine you're about to blow my mind with... I'm going to blow your fucking mind here, Joe. Because unlike this terrible ragtag army we've been introduced to, he was in another very hot sci-fi war zone from the mid-90s by the name of Starship Troopers. Oh my god, what, what the fuck? Was, was, he, was he the pilot? No, this is Kitten Smith. You'll remember him from the scene where uh, they're getting tattoos and Gary, Jake Busey pours whiskey all over Johnny's arm. And then later on, during the invasion of Clendathu, uh, he's the dude who gets ripped apart on live TV and thrown at Johnny Rico right before he gets stabbed in the leg and sent off to surgery. Well, I'll be damned. I definitely forget him. But it's good that he found another opportunity for him to be a a, a dude with a gun in some pretty basic 90s uh, costuming. Uh, the So, you know, you, you, it's basically the most cliche war movie of all time. That's what Chakotay's fallen into. Mm-hmm. It's, it's the band of brothers in the jungle fighting against an implacable foe. You know, the, the scrappy defenders. You know, there's the, the fresh recruits. There's the wise leader. There's the patient veteran. You know, they're all men of honor defending their homes. Uh, it It is as if he fell into like the Green Berets, you know, like a, a sort of almost cartoonishly perfect war movie story. So I think the whole beginning part of this episode is bad. And my opinion of it starts to improve exponentially the closer to the end that we get. And I'm curious for you if that was a shared experience or was your similarities to these Warhammer guys drawing you in tighter earlier in the episode jokes aside, as I, as I am aware that at this point it would be your desire to uh, turn your trembles into rages, you know, and, (laughs) and, and to nullify this podcast and this episode and in the same way that, you know, I mentioned, I hope someone burns your house down over this. The, the nemesis has flamed their villages and, and tore from you your coverings. But <laughs> the, I liked the dialogue. I liked that despite the fact they had this very foreign sounding dialogue, the actors played their archetypal roles particularly well, you know, like you knew who these guys were supposed to be. I never felt like any of them were doing anything but maximum effort. And maybe actually the dialogue helped in that sense because it was so weird sounding. They had to really like put a lot of emotion into it to make it clear what they were saying and communicated well to me. And, uh, you know, the the perfect not quite right nature of this was never so obvious as to tell you as the viewer that something was clearly wrong before they laid the twist out on you, you know? Right. So goofy dialogue aside, I agree with you that these guys are falling into tropes and they're doing a good job portraying them. My frustration comes out hot and heavy in the beginning out of Chakotay's behavior. We have spent 
this entire season so far and the tail end of season three, like we keep coming back to whitewashing the Maquis previous lives away. And here you have a guy who prior to meeting Voyager should have been right at home in this exact sort of situation. Guys who are understaffed and grossly outnumbered and outgunned in an impossible fight where they are going to be willing to die in the trenches anyways, as the Maquis battles the Cardassians. And in the beginning, you don't see any of that at all out of Chakotay. In fact, there's an entire uh, scene where Chakotay has been drummed off. Uh, oh, So, yeah, his shuttle gets down. He's trying to get a hold of Voyager. And, of course, the big bad evil guys are jamming communications. And these army dudes are like, look, if you're out in the jungle alone, you're going to get killed. So just hang out with us. We'll give you an escort back to the base camp and you can call your ship from there. But if you're going to be out there marching with us, you need to be ready for some shit because, uh, you know, these guys aren't going to care about what uniform you're wearing. They're just going to kill you because they're motherless evil. Basically, they accuse them of rape like 800 times in this episode. They're they're you know, eat your grandpa and, and rape your sisters and mothers. There's a there's a lot of weird sister mother references in here. Yeah. Yeah. My wife was watching this with me and she's like, yeah, do they, do none of these guys have girlfriends or wives? They like, say, what, dream of your sisters and mothers, lads. Yes. And it's like, uh, did they, did, did Chakotay land in Martinsburg, West Virginia? Like <laughs> six awkward boners and three furious masturbation sessions later. <laughs> so he's in this, uh, the scene with Kitten Smith who or yeah kitten smith who's the 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 real wet behind the ears kid and he's supposed to be learning how to use this very obvious earth assault rifle and uh kitten smith's like you know people don't like me because i'm afraid and and this and that and you know i get scared when we go out into combat and chakotay starts laying down like this ultra pacifistic peace and love and you know i really go out of my way to try and find ways to resolve uh, differences with peace. And it's like, first of all, Chicote, you were a terrorist and you were a terrorist who used to brag about all the dirty tricks up your sleeve and all the dudes you used to F up and how you met your buddy in a mining colony and beat a bunch of people's ass before he died in a Kazon raid and all of this stuff we're going to call season one and two. And now you're giving them this kumbaya speech, which is a super hypocritical and like ignorant of your own history and be like, are you really doing this guy any favors? Does it seem like this world is going to be kind to a pacifist or this guy's comrades are going to be kind to anybody who's like, hey, come on, fellas, maybe there's another way around this. Like now's not really a good time for uh, preaching the 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 the, uh, the laurels of turning the other cheek. Listen. They could have put any dialogue in his mouth aside from what they did in that scene, and it would have made sense. But of like all of the characters on all of Voyager, unless you know you've got fucking uh, what Dolby down there, <laughs> it's like who else in all of of Voyager has a perspective on the necessity of fighting a known evil? Yeah, and, the planet I'm and, from, we avoid conflict. And engage in peaceful negotiations. What? Yeah, except when I decide to go off to the hinterlands and start you know, terrorist bombing Cardassians uh, because I'm sad that a planet got taken away, in which case we're solving our problems with as much violence as possible. I, I, like, there's multiple times where I just wanted to throw something at the screen. And the one that really got me is when he starts talking about the Cardassians specifically. Yeah. I mean, speaking speaking of Dolby's, like they're talking about uh, these guys being awful and basically being like evil murder rapists, and he brings yes. up the, brings Explicitly. up the Kardashians, and it's like, hey, you know, hey, we should go ask Dolby's wife what he what she thinks of him. Oh, wait, that's right. Like he, these guys are awful. They're like space Hitlers, dude. You know, they're space Hitlers. That's why you became a terrorist just to fight them. And you're like, yeah, you know, whatever. Uh, yeah, sometimes it's necessary, I guess. Like. Fuck off. I mean, I would have bought this episode far more in terms of this part of the premise. If he had, if instead of this million, 
wishy-washy milly mouth shit that he's doing is instead of well actually i kind of do understand the necessity of fighting and let me tell you what i can tell you about what's necessary to survive in these circumstances and trying to kind of give him the the wisdom and the sage advice that a old terrorist can give you know yeah hey you know what it hurts and you're afraid and this isn't the person you want to be but I understand it's the person you have to be and you're going to have to do things to survive in your environment and compromise and blah, blah, blah. Hey, you know, we used to run with this one guy. His name was Lon. Boy, was he a handful. You know, he'd just look at you and could tell he just wanted to eat your face. But boy, if he wasn't handy in a fight and that's the kind of shit you put up with when you're living in the shit and every day could be your last. But you don't get any of that. It's like nobody bothered to read Chakotay's character Bible for this entire first half of the episode. And then, you know, finally someone got a clue later on, but uh, they do make specific mention of leaving bodies upturned. And that was the only thing I knew about this episode going in. I think I'd caught it at some point a long, long time ago. And like you it was a forgettable episode, but this religious disrespect that they accuse their nemesis is of like their religion believes that when you die, the soul basically enters or exits the body through the face you know the the forward facing and if you are not facing the earth or the sphere whatever stupid ringer they have for planet you just fly out in the outer space and you're lost in space forever and it's basically hell and uh these guys go the extra distance to tie you down so you're stuck face up when the sun comes up and and damned and if there's one thing chakotay doesn't stand for it's uh Disrespect of funerary rites, as we learned from Spider Skull Asteroid. I mean, if you're going to have a Chicote episode, I think there's like some sort of federal law that means it's got to have some kind of, you know, I don't know how quite to put this, but maybe like bullshit spiritual stuff. Mm hmm. I'm just saying. But it, it's it works for the simplistic version of these guys that we're getting you know like as the plot progresses and we find out why everything has been portrayed in this way it i I, my head canon in this episode is that i feel like chakotay is experiencing this training simulation in a way that's specific to his mind you know like it's all done by projections and it's kind of left unsaid how it is that they managed to like do things that specifically keyed him up and turned him into like being willing to, to fight for them. And to be fair, the, at least for like the first 20 seconds, he's pretty firm on the, I'm an outside observer and I can't get involved in this and I don't want to have your guns in my hands or anything else. But as he's, going off to rendezvous with another camp where he's going to get access to some communication equipment. He's having a little chat, learning about some of the disrespect that these terrible aliens show the natives when his, uh, the, the mouthy Lieutenant before who was giving him some sass just gets dropped with one shot and you get your first glimpse of these awful ass Nausicaan predator beast men before the rest of the unit comes out of the bushes, guns them down. And we were treated to a very touching uh, funeral, which at the end results in the wise older leader coming over to Chakotay and saying, Hey man, here's the dead guy's clothes. Uh, Your uniform's too flashy for the jungle. You need to put this camo on and uh, you're going to be marching with us. And at this point, Chakotay has seen everything he needs to see to activate what I now recognize as the major Chakotay character trait. And this is something that my eyes got opened to by my buddy, Nate, who watched this and he was like, you're, you're going to see in this episode what, what Chakotay is really about. And I can't unsee it now because just like that, this dude hands over the clothing. Chakotay looks at the dead body on the ground. He thinks about, you know, all these terrible stories he heard and he just strips down and and puts this uniform. And like that, just like that, Chakotay goes native. 
he co-ops into the the this week's splinter fraction faction and man you want to talk about a trope right up on par with shuttlecrafts getting destroyed let me take you down the path of chakotay right yeah i mean i was about to say of course his last big spotlight episode he did his exact same thing but take us further down the road so he's born into this tribe and he's got allegiances to the tribe right and then he joins Starfleet. And then he joins the Maquis. And then he joins Starfleet. And then he ends up on his uh, alien astronaut New Jersey space alien planet, right? Right. Where he has everybody lay down their weapons and get naked. And he goes native and starts hanging out with uh, the New Jersey space alien astronauts, sky people. And then he falls in with the Kazon when uh, Nog's there, right? And right. takes on their ways and wants to, you know, go and champion their cause. And then he goes back to Starfleet. And then he fully commits himself to the little house on the prairie lifestyle and is willing to give up the fight to try and resolve whatever goofy planet parasite with the with the monkey in the storm. Uh, and then he gets captured by the... Uh, those cool rock people in blood fever. And he totally throws in with them as like, no, no, let me help you. And we're going to, you know, upgrade all your security and everything else. Ah, That one is just like normal Federation and helping McHelper. Yeah. But I mean, when he gets abducted, there's no resistance at all with him. He's just like, yeah, we're all, there's plenty of all the other ones are correct. That one, eh, that one was just normal Federation helping McHelperson. I think you can go back and make a strong course. And then of course, his full commitment to the Borg commune. And then his commitment to his captor, the dino dudes with putting up zero effort to try and rejoin Voyager and instead go off and champion this guy's evolution theory. Right. To the point of like just blowing these guys and telling them how awesome that, you know, the dino people are. Yeah. Uh, His willingness to just go along with the flow and be completely hoodwinked by the sad sacks. You remember Janeway was the only person to think, hey, maybe we're actually getting effed here. Uh, And uh, right into now, he just perhaps his biggest commitment since uh, Unity, when he throws in fully with this, you know, little local Vietnam situation. Like, I can no longer see Chakotay as as anything but this weak willed dude who is just waiting for a cause to attach onto he's not chakotay he is now (laughs) co-opte i mean what are you gonna say i mean the 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 rim shot joke is out there the indians gone native man it's it's definitely a trope that they have buried so deep into his character that i recognize that he kept doing it yet i never quite like it's it's come so normalized to me Until you went through all of those, I'm like, wow, yeah, this happened more times than even I remembered. It's very true, though. It's nobody else does this but him. That's 10 times. I'll I'll give you the benefit of the doubt. And let's cut the blood fever rock people out. That's still 10 times he's shifted allegiances or completely bought into whatever bullshit someone's laying down. There's a difference between the times he did it because he was trying to, like, feel a situation out like with nog and help him he was obviously still trying to get back to voyager he, he never like declared allegiance to the Kazon, but mm. still like got into it you know you still like dipped his his toes into the to the pool and tried to swish it around and see what he could do so and generously if you were to interpret this character trait you know he's supposed to be this uh archaeologist scientist you know type that that you know, he gets into cultures. So here he is. He's kind of just doing that. But I think that's a little too generous. I think the writers just decided that this is the guy they're going to use when they want to do that story. And someone needs to like, be indoctrinated. March out co op day. Hey, listen, O'Brien must suffer. And Chicote has to go native. These are the axioms of Star Trek. That second one, we found it. You know, we'll call it the Peter axiom since you, you called it out. You did it. 
Well, we're, we're going to give credit to Nate because he's the one who initially opened my eyes to it. And then I sat there and really did the math. Uh, sometime shortly after he puts on the uniform, and I can't say when exactly, he ends up in another conversation. And finally, finally, it's like, OK, I've taken the Starfleet uniform off and I guess the pretense that I'm going to be at all impartial or removed from the situation is gone. Yeah, by the way, I did used to be a dirty old terrorist and uh, everything you're talking about to me now is really just old hat. And <laughs> yeah, this is me. I've done this and uh, it sucks, but it gets easier episode is cleverly structured in that you are fully immersed in the Chakotay storyline for half of the episode before you even see Voyager. When you see Voyager, they're talking about the situation of Chakotay's disappearance and the hunt for him, but they reveal no information about who they're working with. And the stories they're telling make you, the viewer, if you're not already aware of the twist that's coming, uh, makes you think that they're working with the same quote unquote side that Chakotay's on because the same kind of language is being used and uh, the same uh, sort of process of identifying the enemy as nemesis and so on. We don't see a whole lot of the action on their part. Uh, essentially, there's like three scenes with the Voyager crew in it. Uh, and it isn't until the last one when they call up the ambassador they've been working with in the commando team that he's going to, that they're going to send with Tuvok to, uh, to go get Chicote that in fact, they have been working with the, the, the hated enemy uh, the entire time that the reasonable species that, uh, that they've been communicating with and, you know, has been willing to assist them is actually the predator people who talk normally. <laughs> Thankfully, uh, there's one of the first Voyager, you know, shipboard scenes that we get. And, you know, again, I, I can't say if it was my first time watching this back in 97 or 98 or whatever, if I would have been keen to it. But the writing is super on the wall that there's going to be a twist in this episode. And they're vague enough in these conversations up in the ship that you're like yeah he's probably on the wrong side or, or there's some something fuck he's going on right but they pull in neelix and consult him about like neelix what do you know about this and neelix is just this wikipedia treasure trove of information on this planet i'm like how the fuck would neelix know any of this and i i pause and i'm writing and you know my wife's like well what, what's the problem with this here she got tricked by the way because she's watching and this this episode has zero seven of nine and i'm like well you know when they started off he knew everything and there was this huge story arc about this character development point where he is forced to realize that past this necritic expanse he doesn't know shit about fuck and they get through the necritic expanse and then they end up in board territory and then kess uses super saiyan powers to knock them like another 10 years forward in their journey like they should be so far beyond anything that Neelix knows a single thing about that him busting out this knowledge. I don't know if they filmed this thing earlier and it was supposed to premiere a long time ago or what, but uh, that was a real head scratcher in I, continuity. I, the interpretation that I took from it was that, uh, you know, Neelix has been doing his ambassador thing and gotten to know what information that he could. You know, not that he had personal knowledge just in his back pocket. Like They're 9,000 light years past Borg space. They're like way the fuck out past yeah. any place he's ever been. But I could see like he got talking to them, trying to find out what's going on, and he's reporting that back. You know, a little bit of extra dialogue there might have helped, but the... It wasn't Fair Trade. What was the Net Critic Expanse episode? That was Fair Trade. Was it Fair Trade? Oh, yes, False that... Prophets was a stupid one. My appreciation of that episode continues to blossom. And in light of what you're talking about here, like maybe, yeah, maybe he is out talking to people and schmoozing. Like I really, that's what's missing for me in Voyager right now is that interaction with the environment, with the Delta Quadrant outside of catastrophes and major issues. Like seeing Voyager pull up to weird space stations and try and schmooze and, and barter. Like that's, that's what I want to see. And it's a shame that we don't necessarily get that. I think you do. I mean, it's just by implication rather than being explicit. So. So back to co-op day's little adventure. 
he is now fully on board with the cause and uh, these guys who had ran out and saved him and he are trudging forward. They're going to go unite with uh, some local badasses. They find out that these local badasses have been eradicated and that all of the corpses have been belted down to the ground, forced to look at the sky, desecrated. Uh, and they're going to go full Rambo and try and take down the nemesis raiding party that got them. They go in. It's a real sloppy firefight. Old Kitten Smith's got uh, got the eye of the tiger and he's up shooting from the hip in a real commando moment. He gets dinged in the arm. He goes down. And I really like when Chakotay runs up to like pull Kitten Smith out of uh, the firefight. He pulls him by like the bad arm. He just got shot. I'm like, what a dick move. <laughs> the the whole him being shot thing is so like quarter assed, though. I mean, oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah, it, it was it was noticeable. It was noticeably not giving a fuck until the you know later on when the writing caught up with his injury. <laughs> yeah, uh, he goes down, and it's too late because Kitten Smith's given his death rattle, and he asks for Chakotay to roll him over before he passes off into the ether beyond and suffers his second science fiction death. And Joe, if you could find the sound clip there, I'll send you the link. There's a YouTube video of Johnny Rico yelling, Kitten, no! When he <laughs> dies. I will gladly uh, put that in. Uh, I, I have to pay you back a little bit for making you uh, listen to me talk about how you don't fathom the nemesis. and mm -hmm. You know... It's it's that our listeners have landed right in the middle of our clash, and it would be sharp for them, perhaps, to uh, to turn uh, their their footfalls and back walk away from our show. You hate me, don't you? <laughs> can I put my can I put my headphones back on? Is he done? <laughs> OK, I'm putting my headphones back on now. Uh, so, yeah, uh, Vietnam does not go well for Co-op Day's little uh jungle squad and he barely escapes with his life and i think at that point doesn't he wander off to the village yeah so the village is definitely the most i don't know like lulzy part of his his adventure in how stereotypical it's getting because not only does he have his stereotypical war buddies he meets the stereotypical idyllic village uh designed I think this I think reinforces my belief that this whole scenario is tailor made to what would would make Chicote lose his shit. But it's a village of people native to the planet that are being oppressed by weird aliens with shit on their faces and having their shit burned down and their crops taken from them and all of their women raped. And it's filled with, you know, grandfathers and plucky kids and, you know, Mother's got some 80s hair, man. Oh, God. Yeah. I mean, <laughs> so that's a, that's the most unbelievable part of this entire episode is he shows up out of nowhere. He's like, oh, look, a defender. That's their name for soldier. A defender. Yay. And they all swarm like, oh, defender. We're so happy to see this little girl just like busts out this Hawaiian lay and throws it over him. And like, it's like, welcome to Elysium. You know, let's recharge those batteries. You look all effed up because you got shot in the arm. Have some food. Get in this cave. We're all going to surround you and S your D and really, you know, give you the warm fuzzies. Yeah, the the schmaltz has turned up to, you know, 11 in all of this dialogue. It's classic war movie shit. Uh, and this is when, like, the Voyager pieces start to fit in a little bit more. And you learn more and more about, you know, the, the efforts they're going through. But you still don't quote unquote no that this is all a simulation that doesn't actually happen until after the stereotypical village gets stereotypically bombed by stereotypical f4 phantoms that apparently napalm they're actually it. cg harrier jets okay okay that's that's interesting yeah if they're going for like full-on vietnam horror then they should have been f4 phantoms but okay yes yes uh, he's going off. He he bids the village farewell. When they say good luck getting a hold of your people, he trods off into the forest. Some 
U.S. fighter planes fly overhead and he starts hearing explosions and he, you know, makes the very obvious choice that he is going to go back and get further involved. And he sees the Nausicaan raiding party laying waste to this and all these people that were just so nice and loving to him getting dragged off into death camps or yeah, I think they're, they're literally pulling him off to death camps. And uh, he's about to start taking some shots when some Nausicans ambush him from behind and knock him the fuck out. Uh, He wakes up in a little prison cave with a lot of the natives that he had just been interacting with. Uh, And, you know, further cements his hatred of these Nausicaan dudes. And then there's some very awkward discussions about cravings and if the little girl he recently befriended could help him with any of those like a lot of real weird vibes in this yeah one, it, it, it came uncomfortably close for a moment of like wait a second is chakota gonna is this is this, yeah, like, get- is this girl offering herself to him like what the fuck is going on here and when she like lays down and like snuggles back into him mm-hmm. I, I, I literally, while we're watching this, I'm like, well, at least she hasn't tried to fuck him yet. Like, at least we haven't had, like, that level of depravity happen. And then that happens. I'm like, oh, spoke too soon. That's just getting a little. She get starts yelling about, comfort. like, you're going to tend me. And, like, between that and all the mother and daughter, uh, you know. This is this one has a weird sex vibe and it's not in a fun way. <laughs> no, not at all. It's and I don't know if it's just something that maybe wasn't there in 97 but listen if they want to have a sex vibe in the show i will take seven of nine you know in her silver cat suit in a wide shot with her ass on view every time over this please no more weird borderline incest borderline child abuse moments please i don't want to do that but i do like when the you know finally getting up close and personal this is the first real view we get of the nausicaan nemesis i don't even know what they're in episode names are like the Kai or something, I think. Uh, yeah, they're, they're terrible, ugly looking things that look like someone sat down in this watchman moment. was like, how do I make an alien that is so terrifying and vile that it will unite an entire people against them? Uh, I also really like that, you know, on one hand, these Irish terrorists knock off jungle people have a real stupid way of speaking, but the Nazican dudes, they've got like these vocorders, like it's clear they can't speak English. So they've got little universal translators. that don't have this robot voice. And I thought that was legit as hell. Uh, it was everything you said to good about the earlier dialect efforts to make aliens actually sound alien. And this accomplishes it way better. It sounded like Pl- it was like Plu Kloon from the star Wars prequels. Remember that guy? It was the mm-hmm. jet, one of the Jedi Masters. He had, he had similar look on his uh, face, and he had the the Vox thing. Yeah, uh, yeah that was the kind of a similar look. I liked it as well. Uh, just just to to move us to completion, the underlying uh, conflict doesn't actually really start until the last ten minutes of the episode. And that is when, A, we find out that, you know, Chakotay may have actually been captured by the bad guys the whole time. And then, B, that's paid off as true when Chakotay actually has to, like, confront the not real version of uh, the uh, the Predator aliens and then suddenly is fighting. the. It gets kind of sloppy at the end as to like when things are real and when there aren't. But what I think that was intended was that he fought the alien, uh, you know, evil Nazi headmaster by punching him a bunch of times, then gets knocked out again. And then like left to die exposed to the sun. And then he's actually rescued for real by the real, uh, Vietnam soldier leader to go fight a real battle. But that's when, Tuvok shows up and saves the day. Tuvok showing up and saving the day was a head scratcher for me. Like, okay, so so now Chakotay has left what has been a terrorist training simulation, and he's going to go off in the wild and start attacking the the Nausicaan guys who have now kind of established are the good guys. 
And as we learned earlier in the episode, Tuvok had a big plan about going down to the planet to rescue him. I don't think they ever really say why they couldn't just scan the surface and find him and beam him up, but whatever. Uh, he's going to go down solo with a Nausicaan commando unit and he's going to bring him back. And Tuvok comes around a corner with his hands up and says, uh, commander, I'm here to rescue you. And Chakotay's like, no, because he just sees a Nausicaan guy. And Tuvok starts talking him off this ledge of, hey, you know, you've been co-opted and you're crazy. You've been brainwashed. And Chakotay's like, no, no, no. And then finally he shakes off this haze he's in and the Nausicaan face disappears. And you just see Tuvok, who is, for whatever fucking reason, wearing one of these terrible black leather uniforms that the fascists were wearing back in resistance. Like, I don't know why he would have chosen to switch his uniform. And I thought they missed a really cool opportunity to make the rest of these terrible beast people turn into humans or something much less scary looking. Because as we'll find out, part of the indoctrination that these uh, these bad guys, the, the bad jungle people put unwilling recruits through is, uh, you know, there's chemical brainwashing, there's electrical stimulation, there's all all colors of the the brainwashing spectrum are here and where these nausicaan guys look like unrealistically evil right they are the ugliest star trek things we've ever seen uh i thought that like all of their faces should have vanished and you would realize really the the full depth of the illusion that these guys had cast on them but no in reality yeah these guys are just ugly as hell <laughs> they they're ugly as hell but it's a little different they don't actually have the vox casters irl they, they just have their mouths, which is almost more horrifying. Uh, they're just very just normal, congenial, talk normally people uh, that just happen to look like horrific space demons. And I did want to say, though, that Tuvok in that uniform was totally like Wakanda Tuvok. Yes, yes. Stevie said the exact <laughs> same thing. It's like, what is this fucking discount Black Panther motherfucker doing? What yeah. is this? Trying to get shot going out in the forest dressed like that, man. For real. So uh, Tuvok talks him out of it. You never really see what happens to the one legit soldier guy who had been kind of, I'm assuming. He just kind of gets pulled away. He just gets, yeah. he, he gets Poochie and stepped off to his home planet. We, we have no payoff, really, with Chakotay having to confront this guy who he thought to be like, a comrade that he had gone through some shit with. Like, I thought that would have been a real good payoff. I was deeply disappointed. And at no point does like Maki or does uh Chakotay pull any like real dirty Maki tricks out and be like, you know what? I'm buying into this 110%. Let me show you guys how a war is actually won. Yeah. It's just like, hold on. Do you guys have any metal? I want to show you what a pipe does. I want to show you. <laughs> I want to show you what a pipe does to a man. It will really change you. Yeah. So some failed opportunity there, but they get him back up to the ship. We get a rundown from the EMH about how fucked up Chakotay shit really got down there. And it's like Janeway standing right there hearing this whole report. And Chakotay just has the shell shock look on his face like, I don't really know what the fuck happened. Is any of this real? Uh, I am in a very clear confusion haze. And one of these 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 predator dudes walks and he's like hey what's up i'm uh president of the planet and uh, i just wanted to say i'm real sorry that happened to you and jacote's looking at him like ready to punch him before he just kind of rudely is like uh i gotta get out of here and, and takes off <laughs> and everybody's just looking at each other shocked and sick but like oh my god what was that all about you know he just got brainwashed you know he's just like been fantasy murdering your dudes you know he still has like lingering effects thinking you guys kill old men and eat little girls but what, peter what? <laughs> peter that's all true but they have to make sure they him handedly deliver the moral of the episode right into your into your face before they roll credits and this is the only way bro come on come on man in, in a groan worthy moment it's like i wish that it was as easy to stop hating as it was to start you know, and then that's when the the when the more you know, doon 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 thing happens across the screen. It's a little much, but that's why they're doing that. So this is a Kenneth Biller uh, episode. We've we've gone through what he has done 
bad, like twisted. We've done, gone through what he's done good. And I think somewhere in here, there's a really good story. The beginning is kind of trash, but when we get down towards the end where he is now justifiably bought into all of this, uh, you start getting some pretty good action. And I was not expecting until pretty late in the episode that there was going to be the deception trick. So for what I thought was going to be a very black and white episode, I thought the conflict here wasn't going to be Chicote got tricked and now he's got this conflict he should not have been a part of um, that he got duped into. I thought it was going to be a legit black and white situation that he has gotten into and Janeway's disappointment at his decisions willfully made to insert himself into a local conflict. Regardless, does it satisfy you to nullify our review of this episode? Well, what are your closing thoughts on it? I'm, I'm curious. I really liked it. I I genuinely enjoyed some of the things you didn't. The premise of it I thought was cool. I love the dialogue thing. It made him seem alien. Uh, I think my head canon is, is like this was designed specifically to get to him. Uh, there are some obvious mistakes that prevent it from being a really good episode. Instead, I'd put it in that like B minus territory that, you know, the strong idea faulting execution, you know, category of Voyager episode we see so frequently. Uh, but overall, though, I got to say, I enjoyed more of it than I thought I would. The fact that these guys were basically uh, kind of a devil uh, troopers, you know, like they they're in the jungle. They're used to everything fucking killing them. You know, they're all you know, hard as nails, you know, with their bolters or whatever, getting ready to slay the emperor's foes. Uh, I dug and some of Chakotay's dialogue sucks, but for the most part, he's actually the right character to be in this episode. Yeah, like I said, I think they should have gone a little deeper into his history and really embraced that. that yeah, he should have gone more to, to his. Yeah, he should have. I mean, he should have went full Rambo, I think. Yeah. Like setting traps, blowing dudes up like that's. That's the action episode I think they should have given us here instead of the cheap gunfight. And I got to say again, man, if I can recognize a prop as something that's very clearly contemporary uh, American or current technology like these assault rifles, it just really pulls me out. I get it, though. Like sometimes they run across low technology races, you know, like uh, that part is OK to me. Uh I don't know if this episode really would have been helped by those being laser guns. You know, yeah, it didn't like, have to be laser, just something that's not a uh, a current firearm yeah, with any, no any, treatment. Any gun they're going to get is going to look like a gun. You know, it, mm. I think there's only so much that they can do there. I will say, though, that um, you are correct in that this episode needed Chakotay to lean in more to his terrorist past. Yeah. As part of his evolution. If it was really going to pay off, but that's why it's a B minus to me. I'll go with a C plus on it. And certainly it's not anywhere near the worst we've seen. And I think, again, it pulled itself out. I did want to say one comment, though. You you th- insisting that uh, these simulations were uh, specific, like they walk back in the camp. And they get, you know, Tuvok's like, I can prove this is all bullshit. They go back at the camp that was just recently ravaged. And uh, and looted and everybody's back in their place and they all come up like, oh, hey, and it's the exact same response he got when he initially walked in. They're like, I'm assuming those guys are all holograms. I think the brainwashing portion of this should have been like a VR thing. And then I would have bought that it was all specific and custom tailored. But this seems like it was a, a general training regiment. But again, uh, I, I appreciated the plot twists. They became pretty apparent early on uh, mid episode. But it was still a good move to go. And I think at the end, it was cool to see that there's just, again, despicable alien races out there that pull some real shady shit and that the Delta Quadrant is not a nice place. Agreed. Agreed. I'll take something like this over the kind of the turd that we had to watch with the Day of Honor last week. So this was a step up, in my opinion. This was interesting. It held my attention the entire time. So and what are we watching next week, Peter? 
Season four, episode five, Revulsion. Uh, Voyager sends out a shuttlecraft, which is destroyed. And when the replacement shuttlecraft goes out to save them, that is also destroyed. <laughs> no. Uh, <laughs> Revulsion. You got Tom and Bellana looking real cheeky, sitting in sick bay. Voyager receives a distress call from a survivor on a damaged ship. Upon learning of the survivor is a hologram, the doctor joins Balan on the ship. Well, thanks for the spoilers, Netflix. <laughs> oh, you remember I, this episode, Joe? I do. I remember it well. It's very good. You will like this one for sure. Like you specifically, Peter. Like this is not me. You know, trying to suggest that you know, like it, tricking you. You're gonna like it. Well, I look forward to seeing it. Uh, sadly, we have exhausted all of our war-themed rules of acquisition, so I can't peel any of those off for you here but uh are yeah you, are you saying that perhaps you've become too Stop. gray and that your your heart has become weak and okay i'm sorry i'm just gonna just fade us out on our music now before peter drives us and daddy to murder me and mm. uh thanks for Tomorrow listening to me, please and if this episode is our last one you know why <laughs> see ya